Redeemer exists to help connect Jesus to people, people to community, and community to mission. And whoever you are, whatever you're getting into, wherever you're from, we're so glad you're tuning in today. Before we get into the Bible talk, I want to introduce you to a fascinating man named Edward Bernays. You, you've, you've likely never heard of him. Edward Bernays is the nephew, was the nephew, of Sigmund Freud. And, and many would say, as much as we know about Freud, Bernays was even more influential. In fact, he was voted one of the most influential people of the 20th century. He, he worked for U.S. President Woodrow Wilson during World War I to, to work in the propaganda office, actually to leave the propaganda office during World War I. After the war, in the 20s and 30s, he worked for American tobacco companies. What he did for the tobacco companies was he leveraged the desires of women during the suffrage movement, and he connected cigarette smoking to power. He learned that, that by connecting desires to purchases, you, you can actually move people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise want to do. Bernays knew what, what the Bible communicates clearly. We are desiring people, driven by our desires, even above our brains. See, the people of God, they, they had miraculously been delivered across the Red Sea. They had been given what they desired. From Exodus chapter 2, they, their groanings, were told, reached God. And they said, we want to be delivered. We're, we're tired of being under the yoke of Pharaoh. God, please deliver us. And God did it. We, we saw it last week in the Bible talk that Thomas gave. Their desires were met, and then in Exodus 15, on the east side, the deliverance side of the Red Sea, they threw a party and they praised God. Chapter 15, 1 through 22. Yet, yet it's actually in the following days, months, and years, through testing in the wilderness, that we actually see the, the reality of their hearts, their true desires. It's, it's actually pretty ugly when we see it. It's going to give us actually a few minutes to, to look at Israel and consider their desires. It gives us a few minutes to, to consider our own heart longings as well. We see today God delivered his people from Egypt. And in the process of the next 40 years, he actually begins to deliver his people from themselves. Salvation was established as they crossed the Red Sea. Sanctification starts on this side of the Red Sea in the wilderness. As we continue to look at the journey of the people of God, let's spend a few minutes and examine our own desires. Let, let's put ourselves back in our emotional position of March and April of 2020. Maybe for you it was January and February, the third lockdown of 2021. Let's recall the fear, the worry, maybe even for some of us the grumbling that took place, and let's see how the testing for us just like the testing for Israel revealed the natural heart longings and appetites that's, that's really in there. Let's consider Exodus 15, 20 through, 22 through 27. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. They went into the desert for three days and they couldn't find any water. Though The water that they found was bitter. It wasn't drinkable. And the people of God grumbled against Moses saying, where are we to drink? And God directed Moses to a log that was sitting by the side and he said if you throw the log in the water is going to become clean and drinkable so he did the lord issued a ruling and an instruction and, and this refrain comes up three times through the next two chapters he put them to the test he said if you listen carefully to the lord and do what is right if you pay attention to his commandments and keep all his decrees i will not bring on you any of the diseases i brought on the egyptians for i I'm the Lord who heals. First big idea here, before we consider our own desires, let's look at the desires of God. God delights in our obedience. He delights in our obedience. It's not a prerequisite to have relationship with him. Remember, Israel has already been delivered. They've already been saved. They found salvation on the other side of the Red Sea. God delights in our obedience as a pathway for flourishing and relationship with him, for sanctification. He said in verse 26, if you listen carefully, if you do what's right, and if you pay attention to my commands, if you keep all my decrees, I'm going to bless you. These requirements were not the reason for salvation. Salvation was already accomplished. These requirements are the pathway to sanctification, and it takes place through testing and in the wilderness. The promise in verse 26 and 27 is, if we trust God, we will come to find that he 
is the God who heals. He, he showed a physical demonstration as the water, the bitter water was healed when the, when the log was thrown in and in the same way that the bitter water was healed. He can actually heal our desires. He desires our obedience and he can step in and heal. Listen, do what is right in his eyes, keep his decrees, receive healing and receive blessing on this pathway to sanctification. It's actually the, what, what, what happens next in Exodus 16 and 17 that shows us humanity's impotence to enter into this pathway with God. Exodus 16, the, the community was led on and the whole community grumbled against Aaron and Moses. They were hungry, didn't know where the food was going to come from. They said, if only we had died at the Lord's hand in Israel. Thomas told us last week they, they had deficient desires. They were delusional about their past. If only we were back in Egypt. We sat around pots of meat, even though we were subjected to, to the worst kind of slavery. We sat around pots of meat. And the Lord said, I will rain down bread from heaven to you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough food for that day. In this way, I will test them. He says it again. So in 19 and 20, Moses said to them, no one is to keep any until morning. However, some paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots. God had a prescribed way to provide for his people. In 26 and 27, six days you're to gather, but on the seventh day of the Sabbath, there will, there's not going to be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Second big idea here is testing proves our desires are deficient. It showed up for, it showed up for Israel and as their appetites drove them to fear. They, they, didn't, they didn't have storehouses to, to store up food in and they didn't know if they'd have enough for tomorrow. Fear drove them and negative responses to God into disobedience. It showed up in anger. Their awry appetites showed up in anger. They, they said, you can almost envision them shaking their fists at God. We would rather be back in Egypt than, than be free here with you. As testing revealed their deficient desires of Israel, it's likely life over the last year has shown you and me our own deficient desires. We, we could call these desires and appetites loves. And when our loves get threatened, it creates an emotional response in us. And, and so think about this last year. What were the dominant emotions for you of the last year? Now trace those back and consider what loves were then threatened to create those emotional responses. For me, it was comfort. The love and desire for comfort got threatened early on. I was waiting for that first weekend to come of lockdown and try to find relief. The first weekend came, but there was no relief. There was really no comfort to be found, and, and, and it produced the emotion of anger in me. I was getting angry with, with those at home and others. These, these threatened loves actually produce negative emotions. Maybe like Israel in the wilderness, you've experienced that there's a more ruthless, a more powerful slave master than, than the slave masters of Egypt. You and I are actually enslaved to our own desires and our own, own appetites. From Jesus to Paul, the New Testament is clear. We are enslaved to our sinful desires. And, and it wouldn't be a bad thing, right? If our desires drive us, it wouldn't be a bad thing if our desires were always good. But the essence of sin is not that we do the wrong thing. The essence of sin is that our hearts produce the wrong desires. Slavery is more, guys, than just a physical condition. Slavery is a condition of the heart. And testing in the wilderness for Egypt and testing for you and me of the last year has, has likely proved it. And it's dire if the story stops right here. But, but as we already talked about, chapters 1 through 14 of Exodus are, are the salvation of Israel, getting Israel out of Egypt. But chapters 15 through 40 is God getting Egypt out of his people. So, so let's continue the journey this is the sanctification journey. God takes his people on to change their desires. Let's look, thirdly, at the God of testing who can change desires. Moses said in Exodus 16, 32, to take some manna that God was providing each day for his people, set it aside. It would, it would go in the Ark of the Covenant that traveled with his people 
for the next thousand years so that if ever they questioned the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, they could look to the ark and remember, my God provides. My God is a healer. And in the New Testament, Jesus picks up on, on manna after he is, he's just healed, uh, he, he's just fed 5,000 people. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me would never be thirsty. God's provision of meat and bread and water in the wilderness was always intended to point to Jesus. He's the bread that comes down from heaven to satisfy the people of God. Jesus satisfies the appetites and desires of his people in a way that manna never could. He does it abundantly, and he does it unto eternal life. God's people in chapter 17 were led out of the desert, and they come to another place where, where it's called Rephidim in chapter 17. There was no water to drink again. Moses cried out to God as they grumbled at him, God, what, what am I supposed to do with these people? And the Lord said, Go in front of the people, take with you some of the elders, and take in your hand the staff which you, which you struck the Nile with, and go. I will stand before you on the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Incredibly, the sinless, the sinless God tells Moses to strike the rock on which God was standing to provide for his people. It's an act of provision. It's also an act of judgment. With the grumbling of the, the people of God in his ears, Moses raises the staff and he strikes God. Sinless, providing God. God takes the blow of judgment so that he can release provision and blessing to his people, like, like the river of water that flowed out of the rock. Just as Jesus referred back to the manna in John 6, Paul refer, refers back to this rock in the wilderness in 1 Corinthians. He says, they ate the same spiritual food, they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. What happened in Rephidim, it's actually a picture of the cross. Just like Israel was supposed to look at the manna in the Ark of the Covenant and remember the faithfulness of God, you and I, we can look at Jesus, the rock who was crushed on the cross for us. We can remember his faithfulness when we question it. We can remember that our God is a healer as we look to Jesus and the cross. It's here where our deficient desires can be made new. In the last year of testing, it's shown you and me that our appetites are awry. Like Israel wandering in the wilderness, we, we need our desires reoriented. We, we need our appetites renewed. And, it, and the answer is to, to look back to the cross, recall the work that Jesus did on the cross, recall his faithfulness to us. Ezekiel 36 says that it's actually, it's actually those who believe in Jesus by faith. Hebrews 10 picks up on it as well. Believe in Jesus by faith and God will give you a new heart. No longer a heart that produces selfish desires, but a heart that hungers and thirsts for righteousness. For those who aren't yet believers today, consider what C.S. Lewis said. Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. You've been looking for a place where your desires can be met and fulfilled, friend. Look to Jesus and find fulfillment. Be satisfied in Jesus. And for those who aren't yet, who, who are already believers, you've already been taken across the Red Sea. You've found salvation on the East Bank. You're, you're now in Exodus 15 through 40, the testing in the wilderness, the sanctification journey, and, and the erroneous affections that continue to pop up for, for you and me, just like Israel, they can be met in Jesus. We can hunger and grow in a hunger and thirst for righteousness, as Matthew 5, 6 says, instead of our own gain, instead of our own pleasures, as we look to Jesus. Israel looked to the ark and the manna we can look to the cross, and it's in so doing, day after day, week after week, and year after year, that our, our desires are transformed. Our appetites are set anew. The testing of the last year has proven that there's still some Egypt in each of us, but it's believing in the God of the testing where our desires can actually be transformed.